Hey there, gang. Ian from the Sword and Spatula Tavern here with the first video in our new series, History Check, a series where we break down the lore of the Forgotten Realms as it relates to all your favorite video games. Today, we're going to talk about the town that everybody's been talking about the last couple weeks, Baldur's Gate. We're going to talk about where it is, why it's important, and touch on its past and present happenings. Let's roll the dice and get right into it. Let's start with the where. Baldur's Gate is the largest metropolis on the Sword Coast. It sits north of Candlekeep and the Coastway Road, and south of Waterdeep and the Tradeway Road. Being in the middle of two fairly large cities itself, Baldur's Gate is a very important merchant city. Commerce and travel and trade and adventuring goes on up and down the Sword Coast, and Baldur's Gate often finds itself involved in that action for better or worse. Originally built around a natural bay on the northern banks of the river Kianthar, I might be pronouncing that wrong, it made it an excellent port for ships traveling up and down the Sword Coast as well. So not only did you have your foot traffic, but any ships sailing from further north or further south could stop in Baldur's Gate, offload, trade, or even head deeper into Faerun by just coming out and going the other way down the river. The city was founded uh, as a settlement called Grey Harbor. It was a small port hidden along the riverbank and served as a refuge for pirates and scoundrels. Uh, basically what these guys would do is they would set up lights along the Sword Coast and ships traveling up or down the coast would think it was refuge, end up beaching themselves, and then the pirates would come and raid the beached ships and take all their loot back to Grey Harbor. As the wealth of Grey Harbor grew, as more and more of these raids happened and the pirates living there amassed more and more wealth, so did the aspirations of the people living there. One particular sailor, known as Balderon, saw great things for the small harbor town and all the people inside of it. He is allegedly the first person to sail across the trackless sea to the west and explore the vast landscape of the continent and Corum. When he got back to Grey Harbor, his ship was loaded with riches, and so he, what he did was he invested some of that money in his hometown, specifically his home in his hometown. Using his newly earned wealth from his adventures, he commissioned the construction of a large granite wall to be built around his house. The rest of his treasure nobody really knows, although if you ask 100 people, you're gonna get 100 different answers. Some people say that he spent it, some people say that it's buried in various places along the Sword Coast waiting to be discovered. It's literally anybody's ballgame. As soon as he had confirmed that construction had started on the wall, and he had managed to hide or spend or do something with the treasures that were on his ship, get them off of his ship, he loaded back up and set sail for the west again, and nobody ever heard from him after that. He just uh, bipped off and that was that. As soon as he left, the, the farmers that lived a little bit farther out from the bay decided that he didn't necessarily need a wall around his house, so they politely suggested that instead of Baldurin's estate, the wall should be built up around those farlands in the north to help protect the farlands that are feeding the people. And they did it. That's what they did. Uh, as the wall came up, uh, a little town sprung up around it as well. People would either settle on the farmland side of the wall or out by the harbor. And then as people settled on one place or the other, they would slowly fill in. And before you know it, the town became a, a town. It was a proper settlement for people of all walks of life to live in. And then at some point, uh, the history books don't really say when, that gate that existed on the wall that separated the farmlands and the harbor would be named Baldur's Gate to honor the man who had inadvertently started what would become one of the biggest cities around. Once the city was founded, there were cycles of conflict and growth, just conflict, growth, conflict, growth. Lots of stories to tell about Baldur's Gate that aren't necessarily relevant for this particular episode. But basically, the city established itself as one of the more notable powers along the Sword Coast. However, it was one of many such notable powers along the Sword Coast. And as the nations of the Sword Coast grew, so too did their aspirations. And one particular nation's aspirations inadvertently prompted one of the biggest threats Faerun had ever seen the ball spawn crisis. It's a big deal for Baldur's Gate, but it will be something we cover in another video. 
So let's just sum it up by saying it was a whirlwind of murder and intrigue that changed things not only in the Sword Coast, but in the regions further south as well. Let's talk about more recent events in the city, including some things about Baldur's Gate specifically that might come in handy during your travels. The city is run by a ruling council of four dukes who cast votes based on the recommendations from a parliament built around 50 upper city citizens. One of the dukes serves as the Grand Duke, who settles ties and is generally seen as the face of Baldur's Gate's government. Two military forces serve under the government, the City Watch, who are funded by the City Parliament, and the Flaming Fist is a mercenary group that's funded by the Council of Four Dukes. While the two are roughly equal in power, they are vastly different in the way that they are organized. The Watch is an orderly, structured group of soldiers, and the Flaming Fist will hire just about anybody and let them do just about anything. As far as proper organized dangers go in the city uh, and surrounding area, the big names that stick out are the Guild, which is um, a group of loosely bound criminal crews. Uh, each crew is run by a kingpin, and each kingpin reports to the head of the Guild. And then there are also Servants of the Dead Three, three evil gods who are no longer with us. They had a kind of a troubled history with Baldur's Gate. Some citizens take to worship them, if not openly, then in private to better position themselves within city power dynamics and things like that. In the event of a tragedy, it's just as likely to be bad luck as it is to be one of those two organizations. Baldur's Gate, the city proper, is made up of three main sections. The upper city sits behind the original gate from hundreds of years ago and is home to the wealthiest aristocrats of the region. The best and most beautiful anything can be found somewhere along the almost two clean streets of the upper city. It's kept clean by ensuring that everyone who has not been spoken for by a patriarch or to uh, had a token issued to them from the city watch must leave by nightfall. The city watch enforces happily every night and then during the day demand an entry toll from any undesirables who want to access the splendors of the upper city. Beyond the upper city is the lower city. It was built around the harbor and it just kind of grew anywhere that it could within the confines of having the big wall separating the poor people from the rich people. Uh, it's packed with more people than it has houses. And it's where the real commerce happens in Baldur's Gate. And with commerce comes crime. While the city watch doesn't spend much time in the lower city, the government keeps the Flaming Fist mercenary group on payroll to serve as a sort of police force. Unfortunately, the Fist operates more like a thuggish occupying army than they do a police force, so most citizens of the lower city only call on them in the most dire situations. Oftentimes, the communities in the lower city kind of police themselves. And finally, past all of the walls, all of the gates, is the outer city. It spills out uh, all the way down the coastway, up around uh, a larger hill. Uh, if the lower city is a game of craps, then the outer city is... Uh, street dice basically it's everything the lower city wants to be and everything the lower city isn't if that makes sense unregulated trade n very few members of the watch or the flaming fist patrol out there it's a very very dangerous place to spend your time but it can also be very very rewarding some people say that the best and worst of Baldur's gate call outer city their home jump about a hundred years past that ball spawn crisis i was talking about earlier with four or five little mini crises in between, things are not going so great for the Sword Coast. Just a couple of months before the main character of Baldur's Gate 3 wakes up with the brainworms in their head, a city to the east of Baldur's Gate known as El Terrell vanished from the face of Faerun, completely off the prime material plane. It was sunk down into Avernus, the first layer of the Nine Hells. The ruler of Avernus, who is the Archdevil Zariel, made some shady deals with the leader of El Terrell, where basically uh, they would get power and Zariel would get the citizens of the city to use his meat shields, more or less, in the eternal conflict between demons and devils known as the Blood War. As it turns out, shortly after El Terrell goes under, one of the four dukes of Baldur's Gate, the, the, the main duke guy, goes missing. And the second in command who takes ends up taking charge makes a similar deal with Zariel for the fate of Baldur's Gate. As all this is going on, it comes after a great period of uh, increasing in murders, people openly worshipping the dead three in the streets. Things are getting pretty bad in Baldur's Gate, and now they're staring down the barrel of being teleported into hell. So as soon as El Terrell goes under, as all the other things are happening, refugees from the city who didn't end up 
sucked down there, kind of make their way all around the Sword Coast, right? The Flaming Fist in response says, we don't want all these refugees. They bar all the gates to the city. They can't get into the lower upper cities. They spend some time in the outer city and just sort of, you know, meander along the Sword Coast itself. All that's happening, a group of adventurers band together, get things sorted out in Baldur's Gate, stop the weird cultish stuff from happening, and then head into Avernus proper, where they defeat the Archdevil Zariel, get El Terrell returned to the Prime Material Plane. Everybody's hunky-dory. Once El Terrell returns to the Prime Material Plane, they are horrified with the things that they've seen in Avernus, and they decide that moving forward, no devilkin would be allowed to set foot in the city. Unfortunately for tieflings, they are devilkin. So all of the tieflings who lived in El Terrell now no longer had a home. They banded under the leadership of a guy named Zevlor, and started moving west towards Baldur's Gate, where, as of the events of Baldur's Gate 3, all sorts of bad stuff is going down on the road between El Terrell and Baldur's Gate, so they don't quite get there just yet, but you kind of unfold that story as you go. Just as a heads up, things to expect in Baldur's Gate, literally anything can happen. Baldur's Gate is essentially the New York City of Faerun. Members of all mortal races are in and out of the city all the time, some immortal beings are in and out of the city as they will. Probably the wealthiest people in all of Faerun live in Baldur's Gate, and I would assume some of the poorest people in all of Faerun live outside of Baldur's Gate, probably. Gold changes hands in piles, paying for anything from like simple potions to elaborate magical artifacts, to sell swords to guard a caravan, to the assassins hired to loot that caravan. Anywhere you look, there's probably somebody who can kill you. Everything's going on all of the time. In a way, it's kind of the same city that it started out as like 700 years ago. Just every man for themselves, chaos, murder, danger. As you approach this city, be mindful there's just as much danger as there is wonder inside those walls. Don't let your guard down for a second and don't trust anybody but the folks you rode in with. And then after like a night or two, probably don't trust them either. Thank you so much for watching this episode of History Check. I hope you learned something. If there's anything that you would like us to cover in a future episode, leave a comment down below. If you liked the video, if it helped you in some way, give it a like. If you want to see more stuff from me and the Sword and Spatula Tavern, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again. Have a good night or day, whichever.